morning. This morning, the choir will be singing one of my favorite hymns, number two, Joyful, Joyful Hymns, number two, verses one through two. Joyful, joyful. morning and welcome to the last Sunday in January. This morning's scripture is Psalm 111 and the theme of the day is Born to Wonder. So I took our first praise song this morning, God of Wonders, from the second to fifth verses in the psalm. They read, great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Please join voices for him as we wonder in the creation of God with God of Wonders.
Join me in prayer. Lord, we have gathered here and in our homes to worship you. We find strength and comfort in those ancient words that the people of God have turned to for so many centuries. Those ancient words remind us that so, so much has changed and continues to change. And right now we find ourselves surrounded by uncertainty and conflict. You and your word remain. So we ask now for your presence among us as we listen, as we learn and sing and pray. And then we will meet you at the table as your invited guests to share there in the symbols of Christ's body and blood and then become one in the Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Now Miss Wendy. Good morning boys and girls. Good morning Community Christian Church. I hope you're doing well. This week at school, I made some snowflakes with my students. They, I taught them how to take paper and fold it in different um, ways and then cut different designs. I made a couple with them and I thought of you all because I thought you might enjoy making snowflakes. What I like about them is each one can be different and it can be unique, just like we are all different and unique. On Wednesday, it was so exciting when it started to snow. I bet you were so excited. I know my students were. We don't have windows in our classroom, so when we were walking through the school next to the windows and we saw the snow, we were just so excited. The kids were going, ooh, ah, almost like fireworks. When we stood there, I just kept thinking to myself how amazing it is to think that every snowflake is different and unique, kind of like we are so different and unique from each other. And I thought, God has created all of this. It's just so amazing. So when I think about that, I think to our Bible verse this week, which is Psalm 111. And in that Bible verse, it says, great are the works of the Lord. And I just think about all the things that God has created. He's created birds. He's created dogs. He's created cats. He's created your parents, your grandparents, trees, all of these things we are so fortunate to have. And I think I just need to be so appreciative of this and just thank God every day for these amazing things he has created because they are so great, like the Bible verse says. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the birds and the animals and the flowers and the trees, the lakes and the streams and the sun that rises and sets over them each day. Thank you for creating everything we see. Thank you for the life we live and for making each person different. Thank you for Jesus who died for us so that we can go to heaven one day just for believing in him. What an amazing God you are. In Jesus name we pray, amen. I hope you are able to take some time this week to just think of all the magnificent things that God has done for you and for all of us. Have a great week. I thought the snow was nice, but not necessarily fun to drive in and picking up kids from school. But they loved it, and everybody went sledding and had a good time, and they are hoping that this week there will be another snowstorm. I don't know if schools this year have snow days or not, because now it's so convenient, right? You can just say, it's not a snow day, it's a Zoom day. So I don't know. Doug says thumbs down, so we'll see. Well, as we've already heard for this morning, our scripture comes from Psalm 111. I want to read it to you now. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. 
Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. That is the testimony of the people of God. So I want to tell you, you know, I've had some trouble sleeping this week. Ever happened to you? But it's not, it's not for the normal reasons. So once the kids are in bed and the cat has been fed and the dogs have been put away and the fish are taken care of for the night and the dishes are done and the laundry is folded and all of that other stuff, I've started reading science fiction novels. Now this is a genre that I have dabbled with in the past, but right now I seem to be entirely gripped by it. And I have to tell you that at the end of the day, with the fireplace warm in the front room and completely quiet, it's pretty easy to stay up reading 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, whatever it might be. But here's the problem. I go upstairs, I fall asleep, and then in my mind, all I can think about is the possibility of life on another planet and the speed at which light travels. And then I start dreaming about this. This is what you do as well, right? (laughs) Well, more than a decade ago, NASA launched what's called the Kepler Space Telescope. And the sole purpose of the Kepler Telescope was to discover other planets. Now, when a planet, a little bit of science here, when a planet passes in front of the star that it rotates, the level of brightness dims slightly. So this is how you can tell how many other planets there are in the solar system, the universe. In the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra, there are 150,000 stars. And the Kepler telescope revealed the existence of 2,000 exoplanets. So what this means is that there are, for certain, thousands of other planets in our universe. There are, in our galaxy alone, at least four billion stars like the sun. So if there are all of these planets, a very conservative estimate is that somewhere between 1.5 billion and 2.4 billion planets could be suitable for some sort of life as we know it, in the, what they call the, the Goldilocks zone. So then I've been reading this book, which, um, you know, there's a little bit of irony here. I've been reading this book about science fiction. It was recommended to me through the uh, AI of Amazon, saying this is a book you might enjoy. And it's called Winter World. It's actually a trilogy, and I've read all three of these books in one week with little sleep. But there's this battle between good and bad, and the future is undetermined. And, and what I like most about the book is that the uh, writing encourages me to ask these questions that I really haven't thought of much in the past. But the questions are like this. Are we really alone Does the vastness of our ever-expanding universe contain other forms of intelligent life? Are we the product of just one civilization or many civilizations? And what does all of this mean for our belief in God, in creation, and about God belonging to us and humans on this earth and, and God perhaps belonging to other beings as well? Does Wouldn't God be worshiped the same way? I mean, the questions just go on and on. I mean, this is what I think about before I fall asleep at night. Have you ever thought about this? 
Have you ever thought about whether or not we are alone in this universe, about how, how, how great the vastness of it is? I mean, when you look up at the, at the stars at night, they, they shine so brightly, well, oftentimes, not all the time, but you know that light is thousands of years old. It's not shining right that second. It's traveled through space. Well, our scripture for this morning, Psalm 111, it does not contain any hidden references to aliens or science fiction. Sorry. But it does fit very well with the idea of science and exploration and discovery and wondrous works of God. In the opening lines of the psalm, the psalmist said, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Now, the message, which is an interpretation of the Bible written by Eugene Peterson, translates this line like this. God's words are so great, worth a lifetime of study. And in the Vulgate, which is the Latin version of the Bible, that verse is carved into the heavy wooden doors of the original Cavendish Library at the Department of Physics in Cambridge University, and in the new building as well, etched over the stone archway, and that is where the uh, strands of DNA were discovered and uh, more recently the roots of the universe and this idea about how the universe is constantly expanding and full of dark matter that makes up 99% of everything, but you can't see it. So as human beings, how do we use this imagination, this creativity, this wonder to study the works of the Lord like the psalmist says? How do we know the what lies both within and beyond. So this week I was thinking about this and I came across the story of a woman named Kathy Olkin. Now Kathy is a planetary scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and her entire job is to focus on the outer solar system. And she talks about how since she was a child, She'd been looking at the, well, I don't know if it's really a planet anymore or not, right? She'd been looking at the planet formerly known as, possibly, right, Pluto. But Pluto is so far away from the Earth that even with the Kepler telescope, it's just a bunch of blurry pixels. And then in the early 2000s, Kathy was commissioned as a co-leader of a team to build a space shuttle, an unmanned space shuttle, to go to Pluto. So this is in the early 2000s. So they build this space shuttle, and they launch it, and they know that it's going to take 10 years to do a flyby of Pluto. And they get one shot to make sure that it works and that you get these photos because there's no stopping in space once you're going that fast. The space shuttle travels at... 39,000 miles per hour. So for some comparison, it took the crew of Apollo 11 three days to reach the moon. It took this space shuttle nine hours. So for 10 years, she monitors this space shuttle, right? It's her entire career. Everything is working perfectly. They are three days from flying by Pluto, it's on the 4th of July, she's been working for months on end, the team is excited, she decides, I'm going to take a day off, enjoy the day, but before I do, I'm going to check my email, she has an email, and it's from the uh, commander of the, uh, the team, the co-leader that she works with, and it says this, the shuttle is on standby, that's not good, for Almost 10 years, the shuttles worked perfectly and never got on standby. Standby is when the computer shuts down because something is wrong. But all of a sudden, they are three days from Pluto, and they have to fix the problem or they're not going to get the pictures. So they work day in and day out for three days straight. They think about using a backup computer, but they've never turned it on before in 10 years. And you know how computers are. In 10 years is a long time for a computer, so they're hesitant to do it. They decide they're going to stick with what they have. And just in time, the computer system reboots. Uh, by the way, it takes, because it's so far away, four hours for the messages to reach one another. And so it's kind of like, hi, Hi, try this, okay. But they get it. And here's what they discover. They thought that maybe Pluto 
would be just as dull and gray as the moon. In fact, in the city of Boulder, they had um, a big a party set up for the flyby with the photos coming in, and they hired a band because they thought maybe the band would be more entertaining than this planet that they were going to look at. But here's what they discovered. Pluto is a mesmerizing planet. It has mountains made of ice that are taller than the Rocky Mountains. It is a canyon that is deeper than the Grand Canyon. It has a glacier, and you should look this up on Google sometime. I should have brought a picture. It has a glacier made up of nitrogen and carbon monoxide glazes that is shaped and looks like a giant heart. And what Kathy and her team discovered is that this once a uh, collection of blurry photos from telescopes on Earth became known. In other words, the unknown was made knowable, if not yet completely known. Now, that's kind of a long line, but that's the way I think also that faith works. Beauty connects us to God. Beauty of the creation of the universe leads us to faith and to wisdom. We certainly live in a very disjointed world right now, right? Full of uh, fragmentation and hatred and violence, but even within the profane, there is the sacred. The word cosmetic, which means to create beauty, comes from the Latin cosmos. The cosmos, the universe, is full of the beauty of God's creation. So if you can take all of this in and and, and interpret what the psalmist is saying, the psalmist is saying, step outside and look at the grandeurs of the earth. And and, and when you did a perfect job in in the children's moment, whether it's a snowflake or a bird or whatever it may be, it's, it's all part of this grand design by God. But then in the final line of Psalm 111, the psalmist says, the fear of the Lord, after you take it all in, is the beginning of wisdom. So what does that mean, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? This, this last line of the psalm kind of troubles me some because I don't like to think of God as like sitting up high on a throne and wanting us to be uh, fearful and cowering. That doesn't seem the way that faith would work, especially because the overarching message of the Bible is one of security and comfort. And uh, we can't ignore the line. I mean, we could have just cut the scripture reading off for the day and not had that last line, but eh, that doesn't seem quite right thing to do. So here's what I think. I think that this line suggests that when or if we act and behave like we are the ones creating, like we are the ones directing or guiding our own lives, when we do that and all of us do it, then I think we begin to lose sight of God. And, uh, I mean, from the very beginning, right, it's tempting to think that, that we can bite into that apple of wisdom and we can be the person who we want to be. We, we can set our destiny. But here's what we discover. When we try to take charge, when we don't allow room for God, when we try to create our own cosmos to guide our own lives and our own destinies, then we lose sight of God. And when you lose sight of God, you lose sight of the awareness of the beauty that surrounds you, of the transcendence of a spirit that is both known but not yet fully known. And when we try to create our own lives, we then in turn create our own gods. I mean, this is the story of the Bible over and over from the Old Testament to the New. And when you create your own gods, it usually does not end well. So what is the key to discovering the beauty and the wisdom of God's glory and creation? The psalmist says the key is to revel in it, to take it all in. So have you ever seen before on a television or something a guy named um, Brother Guy? Work with me here. All right. Brother Guy is a Vatican astronomer a graduate of MIT, a Roman Catholic priest. When uh, he gives presentations, he says, this is a ring from MIT. It's not the bishop's ring. Don't kiss it. Anyway, 
That's just really a theology joke that's probably only funding to a few. So, his job is to be in charge of the observatory at um, the Vatican. That's his sole purpose, to help people see, including the Pope, the vastness of the universe. And in an interview, somebody said to him, why should there be this position at the Vatican? And he said, every religion should have one. The tone is set by the person in the pulpit, and the keys are here curiosity and humility. The point of the observatory, he says, is for religious leaders to say, I don't know everything, and I wish I knew more. That's a pretty good line for a preacher. I think also for a parent, you know? I don't know everything. I wish I knew more. But when I stand on the back of my deck on those clear winter nights, and I look down at the stars that are shining upon us, or I look up as they shine down, I'm reminded of this poem by Walt Whitman. I want to share it with you as closing here. Walt Whitman said this, When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures, were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Through Christ we say together, Amen. All right. As we continue on this morning, we're going to move into a time of prayer. Before we do, we're going to um, use as an introduction to prayer uh, special music from Voices for Him, which is entitled, In Awe of You. So let us prepare our hearts to pray. As we reflect. But first, listen to Scott. As we reflect on Jacob's sermon this morning and stand in awe of the wonder of God's creation, Voices for Him is going to lead you into prayer with In Awe of You. Please join along with us and listen closely to the words that talk about the wonder and the awe of God's creation. Please join us. we turn to prayer, 
I want to be sure to lift up in our prayers Bill Anderson. Bill is the uh, uncle of Chris Fairchild, and he was uh, diagnosed with COVID and is battling COVID, and these are thoughts and prayers, as do so many who are uh, impacted by the virus and all that goes with it. So prayers for Bill and for his family. Let us now pray with one another. Holy God, we are indeed in awe of you. You create the vastness of the ever-expanding universe, the, the possibility of so many planets and stars and, and matter and energy, and yet you still know each one of us. You created us too, and you know our name. And so we stand in awe of you. And we turn to you for strength, for reassurance, for prayer, for comfort, for reminders that we are not God and that we do not control our own destiny, but only in conjunction and companionship with you. On this morning, help us recenter our lives and our hearts and our souls. Help us be in awe and even in fear so that we can come to the wisdom that comes from you. When we feel like we are being overwhelmed or underwhelmed, when we fear as if we do not know what the road holds next, remind us that in the vastness of it all, you have a plan for us. And so, God, we lift up in prayer Bill Anderson and all of those who are struggling with COVID. We pray for our city, for our nation, and for our world. We pray that together we can create a difference in this world. And though we cannot fully know you, we pray that we can know you more and more every day. And that knowledge comes from studying and reflecting, from simply being in prayer with you. Hear us now as we say together the prayer that your Son, our Savior, Jesus, taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we come to a time of offering, we're really looking at what we value and what we want to have happen. We know that God is the creator. He has created this wonderful world, but what does it mean that we should do? It makes us think of plans, but right now it's really difficult to plan. Think back a year, end of January, beginning of February, in the year 2020, maybe you were sitting in the same pew. What were you planning? You were looking ahead, and it all fell apart. And it's not back together yet, if ever. So the experience of 2020 and living through the months of the virus has taught me two things, and if I didn't know them then, I certainly know them now. It has taught me that we are not in charge, and it doesn't matter how much money we have, how much education, where we live. We, people, are not in charge. And it has taught me that we are all connected. We are all connected. Here we are, the richest nation in the world, and we're really struggling. We really don't look like a shining light on a hill, to paraphrase Matthew. We didn't plan this and we just can't solve it quickly. We can't even solve the problem for us. 
and we have to think about the rest of the world. And it really was amazing just how fast the rest of the world was affected. Our women's group here at CCC supports a little girl in rural India, and she lives in one of the mission partners of Global Ministries. And by very early spring, her school was closed due to the virus. The news often has on it a man speaking for the World Health Organization, and he looks out at the screen and he says, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Everyone, everywhere. So here we are, all of humanity, looking for something to lean on. And all we have to lean on is found right here. We only have to look around and ask. Ask in the words that have stayed with me for the last number of years, the words that the leader of that building site in New Orleans after Katrina said to us each night, Reverend Moore, or Brother Vance as we called him, and he would gather us together and say, where did you see God today? Where did you see God? And so I've thought this week, where did I see God? And my world is smaller this year, but I can see God. Perhaps in that grocery cart left outside Aldi and not pushed back in. Maybe for a woman who comes up with a baby or an older adult, they just don't have that quarter handy. Maybe it's in the email from the church office with an offer to help with the very confusing vaccine signups. Maybe in a thank you note for what I thought was just a routine job. Or maybe in the actions of a circle of concerned worker who carefully sets aside rice and ensure liquid and then watches for a car driven by the wife of a circle client who has advanced ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, who can no longer have solid food. Yes, we can see God around us if we look. So let us remember as we prepare our offerings this week and remember the words that most of us learned in those little chairs in the Sunday school room this is my father's world, oh let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. As we come down to the table to share a meal with one another, Betty, will you please lead us in prayer? And I always love Betty's little mini sermons, don't you? Yep, she can preach it all the time. Yeah. I'm not sure my grandchildren and listen a lot, or my children. <laughs> well, you trained your husband, Carl, well. I, I don't so. know. But... All right. Let's pray with one another. Lord, we have come to your table to share in the symbols of your body and blood the bread of this life and the cup with its promise of the life to come. So here in the sharing of this meal, we know we meet you. And here we are reminded that we are all connected as members of the family of God. So we pray now in the name of Jesus. So help us to remember the lessons he taught when he came here to live among us, to show us how to live, how to love, how to care for one another. Help us to go out and be Christ in the world, for it is in his name that I pray. Amen.
Amen. Now we recall that in the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread. After giving thanks, he blessed it and he broke it. He handed it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he arrives. We give thanks to God for being able to share a meal with one another. And now I invite you to stand as we sing with one another, Go, my children, with my blessing. Let us stand and sing. And now as you go forth, may you go forth fed and nourished, joyful and free, reveling in the vastness and beauty of God's creation. Go in peace. Through Christ we say together, Amen.